So I'm Sarah Walter. I'm the CEO of the Parent Child Home Program, and I am delighted to welcome you to the first Parent Child Home Program School Readiness Forum, organized for you today by Public Prep and the Parent Child Home Program. Um, we are really pleased to have brought together today um, a really incredible group of thoughtful people who have been wrestling with the achievement gap, um, many of us for many years, um, and are going to be here today to discuss with you some approaches to addressing the achievement gap. Um, I think some of which they will agree on and maybe some of which they won't agree on, but that <coughs> will make for a lively discussion. Um, I want to start, though, by really thanking our host committee, whose names you are about to see on the screen, um, without whom we would not be here today. Um, certainly, you would not be here today, since they are the folks who invited most of you. Um, and so we're really pleased that um, Josh Schwartz, our board member, was able to pull together this amazing group of folks and really thank them for um, having filled this room and having um, a great input into the content and the issues that we're going to discuss today. So many of you have heard of the 30 million mark gap. It's become kind of a common trope in our discussions about the achievement gap. It's the difference in the number of words that low-income children have heard um, in comparison to well-off children uh, before they even reach kindergarten. That gap is devastating. But what's really devastating is that it's really only the beginning of a gap that tends to follow low-income children throughout their academic career. We know a lot about what causes the gap. Um, we have quite a number of ideas about how to address it. But to date, there's not been a consistent national and state policy focus on how to close that gap so that we can get the value we want to get out of all the wonderful education reform efforts that have been happening in this city and around the country. We know some really simple facts. We know that having books at home is twice as important as your father's education level for future school success. We know that only 47.8% of children between birth and five years old are, ready, are read to every day by uh, their parents or another adult in their lives. 37% of kids nationally arrive in kindergarten without the skills they need to be successful in school or in life. There is al almost a 90% probability that children who are poor readers in first grade will still be poor readers in fourth grade. And in fact, low achievement in fourth grade is one of the most powerful predictors for not graduating from high school. The children who aren't reading at grade level by the time they enter fourth grade are four times more likely to drop out of high school than other kids. So given that we know all of this, what should we be doing to address these issues? That's what our panel today and our keynote speaker are, are going to get you thinking about. And we're looking forward to um, some lively discussion up here and then um, some lively discussion with you all uh, after both our keynote and our panelists have finished. So we are going to kick off um, in just a minute with our keynote speaker. But before we do that, I'm going to give you just a second on the Parent Child Home Program and why it is that we felt it was important to gather all of you here today. Parent Child Home Program is one of the programs that sits in that zero to four span um, that is actually making some huge strides in preventing the achievement gap for the low-income families that we are able to reach, uh, both in New York and in 13 other states. Families who participate in our program get lots of books, lots of good books, um, but we also make sure that the families know what to do with those books, which is a key piece of, of this continuum of services. 80% of the families that we work with nationally live at or below the poverty line. They get from the Parent Child Home Program 92 home visits by a community-based early learning specialist and 46 books and educational toys that are the tools that that early learning specialist is showing the parents how to use in order to get their kids ready for school. They are modeling reading, conversation, and play activities, and the kids who complete our program enter the classroom ready to learn, ready to be successful students, and they go on to graduate from high school at the rates of middle-class kids nationally. 
So that's why we feel so passionately about a making sure that whether it's this program or other programs in that zero to four space that those programs are built up and that they are connected and in fact woven into the wonderful work that's happening in the K through 12 ed reform movement. Um, and you're going to hear from some of those uh, wonderful partners and potential partners um, right now. We're going to start with our keynote. Chris is going to speak to all of us and then we're going to move right to the panel. And then Chris is going to come up and join the panel for questions at the end so that you'll get uh, a rich discussion amongst the panelists and the keynote and, and all of you. Not really sure that he needs much introduction in this room, but I'm going to briefly introduce you to Chris Surf, who is currently the superintendent of schools for the Newark Public Schools, previously the New Jersey Commissioner of Education, in which capacity he oversaw 2,500 2, schools across the state, um, 1.4 million students. Um, before that, he was Deputy Chancellor of the New York City Department of Education um, and has a, had a long, illustrious career there doing um, a lot of innovation and strategic work. Um, Chris also has worked in the private sector, um, and you'll, you'll hear this echoed as we introduce our panelists later. It's a real diversity of education, philanthropy, and private sector experiences that I think have really brought folks to where they are today. Um, one of the, the uh, my favorite things about Chris is like me, he is a lapsed lawyer um, who started his career as a lawyer and realized that it may be the, the better way to impact and make a real change in this world was to come into the education field. So I'm delighted to welcome Chris Sir. Thank you very much. Wow, what a great pleasure uh, to, to be here. I really, really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Ian. Uh, thank you to the host committee. Uh, and thanks to uh, BCG. Uh, uh, this office reminds me a great deal of our office in Newark, so I just <laughs> want to very, very familiar friends. Uh, you, get, you, you get the joke. Um, so, um, so we are gathered here uh, to talk about early childhood and to celebrate uh, BCH uh, P. But I have called my comments today confessions of a K-12 guy. Uh, and uh, that's really what I am. I, uh, I was a high school teacher for uh, uh, four years. Um, as mentioned, I was uh, uh, a deputy chancellor in New York City, commissioner in, in, uh, in New Jersey, uh, and I'm currently serving as superintendent uh, in Newark. And these are all sort of K through 12 with a little bit of pre-K glommed on to the bottom of it. Uh, uh, and so that's really where I have devoted most of my public sector uh, career. So why am I here sort of testifying, if you will, evangelizing, if you will, on behalf of a really radically new societal approach uh, to birth to five? And I think it begins, uh, actually, the answer to that question begins with making sure that we sort of all uh, have a shared view about what exactly we are attempting to solve uh, for. Why do we invest $700 billion a year annually in K through 12 education, second only to the healthcare uh, sector, uh, by the way? What, what's our purpose of doing that? What, what are we trying to uh, accomplish? And for me, it, it comes down to uh, a basic question of that has been plaguing societies really for thousands of years, and that is the question of equality. What are you supposed to think about when you walk down the streets of New York or any city and step over that derelict with the sign? How are you supposed to think about it when you go into a wealthy, leafy suburb and then you go into some of the worst neighborhoods in the city I work in? How is, how is one supposed to, as a citizen, as someone who's committed to, uh, to a greater and good society, supposed to reflect on that? And societies have been struggling with that. Philosophers have been struggling with that. Aristotle gave us an answer, basically Marie Antoinette's answer, which is that's just the natural order uh, uh, of things. Others have said radical redistribution, uh, even if it requires mass violence, and, uh, which is what we saw in some other parts of the world. But the American solution was really quite elemental, and that was we are going to make sure that birth circumstances do not determine life's outcomes. And we're going to do that uh, in a very focused, focused way. It's reflected in all our early documents. It's reflected, of course, it's a little bit hard to sell if you happen to be a person of color or female in 1776, but it is still 
a core basic uh, 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 um, idea. And um, public schools are intended to be the sort of great catalytic agent. And that's the answer to the purpose question. They are intended to give everybody an equal opportunity to realize their full potential, regardless of who their parents were, uh, their country of origin, or, 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 or whatever. But no honest observer can conclude anything other than that that promise has not been fulfilled, not even remotely uh, uh, fulfilled. If you sort of look back to uh, really when we started to sort of focus on this as a country, a lot of us dated back to the early 1980s with a nation uh, at risk, uh, where it was said that if an unfriendly foreign power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre educational performance that exists today, we might have viewed it as an act of war. As it stands, we have allowed this to happen uh, to ourselves. Now, since then, there has been a huge amount of energy, a lot of it expended by a lot of people in, in, in this room. There's been massive philanthropic support. Think back to the early 1990s, the New American Schools Initiative and the half a billion dollars that, uh, that supported that. Think of uh, Gates, Broad, Wallace, and the list goes on and on um, and, and on. And more than that, there's been active, aggressive federal involvement. All the alphabet soup we know of uh, No Trial Left Behind, Race to the Top, now ESSA, all built on the foundation of, of Title I. And that has resulted in what I call, and I don't mean this in a derisive way because I believe in it, but a reformer's playbook. And you know every single play in, in the book focused relentlessly on educator efficacy, be honest about the natural distribution of efficacy in teachers and do something about it. Have high standards uh, associated with real accountability, including closing and restarting persistently failing schools. Use data to drive decision making as a management tool. <coughs> Personalize learning in all its many forms. Leveraging market forces, whether it's a choice at one end of the political continuum, charter schools, magnets, uh, et cetera. And what do we have after 40 years of that kind of money, that kind of attention, that kind of resources. Well, if we really want to be truthful to ourselves, what we can honestly say is that we have put a material dent into the problem. That's what we've done. And it's worth doing and it's worth continuing to do. But it is simply a, a, a sad truth that if one is born into poverty, and if that poverty happens to be in an urban setting, uh, which means disproportionately you are a child of color, the probability that you will graduate from high school truly prepared for success is despairingly low. Um, notwithstanding all of the many, many extraordinary Horatio Alger stories we know of, and this is basically a statement about uh, the aggregate numbers, not about particular individuals, but the aggregate number send a incredibly disheartening uh, 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 message. And Newark is actually, uh, an, uh, where I currently serve, an excellent example of, of that. Now, I have to say that um, there is a uh, very established body of evidence that says uh, you don't judge a whole system reform effort in the first couple of years. You wait five, seven, eight years before you judge it. And notwithstanding what I view as a sort of ahistorical view that has taken hold uh, that unfortunately chose to call the game in the very early innings. As it turns out, Newark's story is one of unequivocal success by the, matter, by the measure that I think matters. It's the only measure uh, that matters. That is, are more and more children every year attending a free equitably available quality public school that prepares them for success in the next phase of life. Everything outside of that statement is for me of secondary or of importance, if even that. So if you could go to, uh, so just a, just a quick review. This is what we've seen our graduation rate do. This is when we began the reforms in 2010 and 20. Remember Newark was a state operated school district. Even this number is suspect by the way, because, uh, we had to bring in KPMG to look at the records. They thought the number was more like 56%. We were graduating a lot of people who hadn't even completed the records of credits. I'm proud to report that it is 78% uh, 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 today. That's a pretty extraordinary gain. Uh, next, please. Um, 
And uh, this, these will really surprise you. If you look at the city of Newark, and these are free and reduced price kid, lunch kids, which are most of, them, most of our kids, uh, you see that our, uh, our, our schools are beating the state at large, beating the pants off of D.C., which is getting a lot of good press. Uh, Illinois, Rhode Island, Colorado, the entire state is performing at a much higher level. This is including charters. And by the way, next slide, if you, uh, you get the same number even if you take charters out. Charters are driving positive change, but is very, very much happening, uh, no matter how you look at the, at the sector. Next, please. We'll just look at the same thing. Um, did we just switch? I did. Uh, same thing uh, in math. The same. Next. Next. Uh, um, I, uh, this tells you something really interesting. This is every single city in America that has 2,000 or more uh, free and reduced price lunch kids. Um, and this is where uh, Newark stands compared to Chicago, Denver, Albuquerque, basically everybody everybody, everybody else. So Newark is doing well. Next. Uh, uh, this is where we were when we began the reforms. Uh, we were uh, in the 44th percentile compared to the 37 most demographically similar districts. We're now with the 80th and 83rd, depending on reading and math. Next, next slide. And I'm particularly proud of this one, that there are three times as many African-American students in Newark who are today going to schools that beat the state average, and 36% of our high school students go to schools that beat um, the, the, the state um, um, average. So um, the question then is, um, well, you might ask, how did these gains happen? That's another talk. We're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about that today. But what I really want to stress for you now is these gains are really positive, and they are not even remote not even remotely good enough. What you've seen is that compared to other cities across the country with similar populations, we're doing as much as two or two and a half times as well, and you've seen an incredibly positive trend change uh, over time, but it is still dramatically lower than children in affluent communities, dramatically lower uh, than students in other cities who don't face the same economic challenges, and it's not just Newark. Let's be honest about this. If you pick any other American um, city, Chicago, Atlanta, Detroit, New York City, um, if you look at all of those, you basically are seeing the same kind of gaps, which are narrowing slightly, but remain uh, alarmingly, uh, alarmingly uh, uh, large. And not just by a little bit, uh, but by a lot. So in my various roles, um, uh, I think it's fair to describe my job as being sort of uh, a mile wide and an inch deep. I know um, uh, a great deal about a lot of things and not much about anything. So when I'm asked, so when I'm asked to sort of identify, you know, what I, you know, what what do I bring to the table? Uh, I, I think my expertise comes into two um, areas, and others will judge. And this is slightly immodest, but uh, one of those is I have something of a uh, Knack for taking on large, historically unnimble, broken public organizations and trying to make a step change um, in performance. But much more relevant to today is I seem to have this sort of neurological pathways to look at seemingly intractable problems in ways that uh, go beyond conventional thinking. See, typically the way the we, people come at problems is they accept the blinders, they accept the parentheses, and they do all their work within the parentheses. And uh, for whatever reason, I tend to start with the view that maybe the parentheses are the problem. Um, and uh, that is something that I think is very much true of um, the subject we are here to talk about today. We, we are um, not going to correct the profound injustice we've been talking about simply by doing the same thing we've always been doing, uh, but this time we're going to do it better. That's just not going to work. We know that's not going to work. We have 40 years of proof that that's not going to work. By the way, they are worth doing, the reformers playbook. They make a difference. Uh, it takes real courage and conviction for all of you reformers out there to keep doing them in the teeth of very powerful interests who are committed to preserving uh, the status uh, quo or things as they are. It takes real conviction and real courage to do that in the 
uh, in the eye of often unsophisticated journalists who too often focus on the marketability of their narrative or the number of hits they get uh, uh, in the paper. So, but still, we can just say with absolute confidence, the only thing that guarantees continued failure is continuing to do what we have uh, uh, been doing. And so as I look around the corner, and as I sort of think about the next phase of the, of the movement, as I think about the degree of difficulty and the magnitude of the problem that remains unmet, um, I think there are three parentheses, if you will, that we need to confront. And the first is, um, we in the K through 12 world are substantially far too much that we are prepared to admit in the repair business. That is way, way, way too many students come to us in kindergarten or even as three-year-olds and four-year-olds, and they're already not only not only badly behind in terms of the 30,000 uh, words and the, and, the, and, the, and the gaps, so, but frankly don't have yet built the neurological foundations that suggest a positive learning trajectory over the course of their life. So that, I think, is one of the things we have to sort of acknowledge and deal with. Second, since the advent of the modern education um, system, we have focused on first through 12th grade. Now, in the 50s, we threw in kindergarten because they, you know, they're young and cute. And then on top of that, we sort of threw in, well, we got to have a pre-K program. So we have three-year-old and four-year-old programs. Uh, we have obviously good ones and lots of them in New Jersey. Congratulations to this city for all it's doing. But we basically have a K through 12 system. That's the orientation. Now, I defy you to identify any city or state in the country that has a birth or prenatal to five system with coordination, with leadership, with a focus on data, with a focus on innovation, with a comprehensive system that is aligned with K-12. They don't exist. Now, you have children's cabinets and you have lots of good people doing good things, but they are splattered and erratic and not often quality controlled. Um, and uh, they are good and meaningful and part of the fight. But if you, the parentheses here that we are working in is we actually don't have a plan anywhere to address what is clearly the fundamental source of uh, um, the reality that so many of our kids are encountering issues in life that are suppressing their ability to be successful learners when they get to school. And the third thing that I think we need to acknowledge, which I suspect brings many of you here, is that developments in neuroscience, as well as research-based interventions that have really solid backing, strongly suggest that radical improvement in academic achievements and life outcomes are actually now possible if we organize and fund the effort correctly. So if you'll flip to the next page. Um, so pretty picture. Um, uh, so I call this the parable of the river. And for me, it is the metaphor that um, uh, drives a lot of the action um, that uh, is underway in this space. So imagine, and I'm not very good at Google Photo, but imagine a little village by a river, okay? A little village by a river. And one day the villagers look out and they see people floating down the river, struggling and drowning, and they rush out and they pull them in uh, and, they, and, they, uh, and they get their boats out and they pull them in and they pull them in. And then the next day they wake up and there are more people floating down the river, struggling and drowning. And then the next day, and this goes on for days after day after day. And then one day, they look out, and they see a young person walking up the river as fast as his or her legs can carry them. And they said, where are you going? We need your boat. We need you to go out. We need you to help. And he goes, I'm going upstream to find the son of a gun who's throwing these people into the river. <laughs> and that seems to me to perfectly state what we are not doing right and what we have an opportunity to do considerably better. Because if you look upstream of the kindergarten experience, you see a lot of uh, things that are incredibly powerful and point us in very helpful um, uh, directions. Go to the next slide, please. Or not. Okay. Uh, so, um, uh, so, so just to, to 
make the make the point. And by the way, psychometricians hate this graph. I don't really understand why, but I, I find it very very powerful. But um, this is where a child is, right? Uh, when um, when he or she first takes the uh, uh, summative assessment in the third grade, that's the score below 150, 160, 170. And that is the probability that they will graduate from high school. This is our legacy test called the HESPA in Newark. So if you come in and you're really behind, right, the probability is diminishing small compared to if you come in and you are, and you are on, on track. So again, the, there's something happening upstream of here that is making a very significant difference there. Um, so um, here's what we know. 90% uh, of brain development occurs before age three, about a million neural connections a day. Brain plasticity decreases with age. The capacity to learn, try to learn a new language when you're my age, it's not gonna happen. Try to learn it when you're two years old, like nothing, right? Brain plasticity, and that, that is very explicable in, 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 neuro, in neurological terms. Um, we uh, uh, looked at the amazing work that's been done at Stanford by Hans Bernal, who many of you know, uh, where she has identified that by 18 months, uh, there's a huge gap in verbal processing speed, and it's highly correlated with poverty by 18, by 18 months. Um, the other thing we know is that the old nature versus nurture dichotomy that we all grew up with in freshman psychology has not survived the test of Time, sure. Um, we uh, we understand that we all have a genetic uh, makeup and predispositions, but especially in the realm of learning, especially uh, they are profoundly influenced by experiences. The sort of header on this is, is the field of, of epigenetics. Things affect what genes come into play and how they are how they um, are, are triggered. Um, the, um, the, um, among those things are literally the number and quality of human interactions. Uh, we'll hear a lot more about that today, but how, uh, uh, whether a child is read to, whether she or he is talked to in the imperative voice or in some, some kind of interactive way, whether there's an opportunity for floor time, as they call it, and play, whether there is, um, when you're reading a book, and when the child goes on a flight of fancy and says, why is the caterpillar hungry? Uh, I like the color blue. Well, why do you like the color blue? I said, no, no, no. I said, why is the caterpillar hungry, right? There are different ways to read, different ways to engage. And that proves to be, and I think this is beyond argument now, to be highly relevant to how the brain is formed and prepares to be a uh, lifelong uh, 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 learner. And we also know on the other end of the extreme, it's not just the nature of the attachments. It are, it, they uh, adverse childhood experiences and they don't need to be abused, they can be neglect, they can be transient, they can be uh, uh, hunger, they can be uh, all sorts of things, create a um, neurological uh, circumstance that um, one lives with for a long, long time. It, it enhances one's flight or fight um, instinct. It makes it very difficult to, for many children to persevere through a difficult learning task to manage, to manage failure uh, successfully, which is a critical part of, of, of learning. Um, so uh, the, uh, uh, one way to sort of summarize the sort of interactive impact uh, of this is in uh, what, of course, we know as executive function or self-regulation skills, which are these sort of foundational elements of, uh, of learning, the ability to concentrate, the ability to organize, the ability to manage a, uh, a, a, a increasingly diverse and complex world, as you see, what the, the development of executive function is something that is substantially time bound. Most of it is happening by the time a child gets to, um, gets to uh, kindergarten. Um, and most importantly, we know all of this. We know that we have to do something. We know that we have an organizational system that is not organized or prepared to do, to, to do it. Um, most importantly of all, and that's what brings us today, is we know there are now interventions that address successfully these scientific and psychological discoveries. And they work. 
didn't work because someone said, gee, this is a good idea, it's going to work. They worked because serious peer-reviewed research has shown that it worked. And let me just use, not a coincidence, but let me just use PCHP as um, an example. This is what we know. And by the way, this is um, an intervention that, that over the course of two years has as many as 92 home visits uh, where individuals come into the home of uh, caregivers and parents, work with them, help them model in a very non-judgmental way. And by the way, these are local people typically who are, uh, are coherently and effectively trained to serve that. I mean, here's what we know, and there's a lot more to it than books. There's, there's a very serious training and review and so on, and we'll hear all about that in glorious detail over the course of the day. But let's look at what the research has said about this. Children are 50% more likely to be ready for kindergarten than their peers, and they enter school performing 10 months ahead of their chronological age. That's a remarkable statistic. Graduates score two and a half times higher on social emotional skills than control groups. Um, and in the long run, the academic results seem to persist, not phase out, and are really, really frankly, uh, eye opening. 30% higher graduation rate than peers, 50% less likely to be referred to special education, um, um, and, and so on. So um, I say that there are a lot of um, things that are happening out there um, uh, in the world. Um, I'm very impressed, by the way, with a digital version of that uh, called Sparkler. And I see the founder of that um, in, in the back of the room, which are home interventions, uh, but delivered uh, on, a, uh, on, a, on a device. Um, they're very exciting things in center-based care um, that, that are showing very promising results, hugely expensive, but very successful. And there are all sorts of things, which I'm sure are on the drawing boards of some of the companies um, that are, are represented here. But the point I want to leave you with is that we have no coherent organization or governmental or philanthropic strategy to do this. It's like, gee, kids, I have a good idea. Let's put a show on in the barn, right? And then you take a little corner of the world. That's a reference that I'm sure nobody gets, right? <laughs> uh, uh, was that Mickey Rooney? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, and, you know, what, what the world awaits is a city, perhaps Newark, that says, all right, we get it. We get the complete lack of alignment with uh, early childhood education, kindergartens with third education. We get the tremendous amount of pre-work that should be we done. We need to have a, a coherent, coordinated, well-funded approach that brings all of that together and demonstrates that, in fact, we can do more than just put a dent in the achievement gap, we can actually fix it after all these years and after all these resources we put into it. So I think I will close with that um, and hand the microphone back to you. I, I, I sit, right? Yeah, got it. Brilliant. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Chris, so much. I think you completely set the stage for the panel that you were all about to hear. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Ian Rowe who is gonna moderate, facilitate, and lead the panel of folks coming up here. Um, there are lots of things I could tell you about Ian, but I'm gonna do the short version of the intro. Um, he is a New York City Public School product. Um, so I think in this room, that's important to know. Um, as I referenced earlier, he is one of the folks with us today who has um, moved through the corporate sector, the public sector working in Washington, um, the philanthropic sector, um, and came back to New York, his, his home, um, to now be the CEO of Public Prep, the nation's oldest and only nonprofit network that exclusively develops exceptional tuition-free pre-K and single-sex elementary and middle public schools. The network now has 350 alumni who, um, who attend uh, top high schools across the city, and some of whom are now freshmen, fresh people, <laughs> at great colleges and universities. Um, but Ian has long identified that one of the greatest challenges his network and other um, excellent networks of charter and public schools across the country face is the incoming readiness of the scholars entering their kindergarten program. And that's why he got so excited about participating in this event and really talking with the panelists today about how we change that. Um, better in, in all of our cities. Yeah. Thank you. 
Chris, thanks for those comments. Uh, uh, it's funny you said the confessions of a K to 12 guy. Um, so I'll, my one confession uh, in my past, uh, I was at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I was a deputy director of what's called the post-secondary success team. Um, and in one year, we gave away $470 million uh, to try and figure out how to improve college completion rates. Uh, particularly for low-income young adults. Um, and we, you know, again, extraordinary work, worth doing. Um, but what we were doing essentially was giving money to institutions of higher ed, um, uh, high schools, community colleges, to help those institution, institutions better remediate uh, kids that were coming into college reading at maybe a seventh grade reading level, right? They, they weren't socially prepared, academically prepared. And it just became clear that we were making massive investments way up the river, right? Um, and so I wanted to figure out how could I lead an institution that started much, much earlier, right? And so I had the opportunity to lead public prep, uh, and thank you for that introduction, Sarah. So girls prep uh, was founded in 2005 as the first and only all girls public charter school in New York City. Um, since then, we've now grown. Public prep now includes girls prep Lower East Side, girls prep Bronx, Boys Prep Bronx, we educate about 2,000 kids in the heart of the South Bronx and the Lower East Side. Um, this past August and September, our first 90% uh, of our initial uh, graduating cohort of eighth graders uh, matriculated into college. It's, it's a, there's some applause there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it is extraordinary. And then going to schools like Yale, Skidmore, Syracuse, fantastic colleges and universities. Um, but the truth is, as excited as we are about those long-term outcomes, I'm terrified as, as far as what we see in terms of what we see every single day, kids coming into our school, kids in kindergarten who are coming in with massive vocabulary deficits, not ready for school. Um, and so the question, I think, for a lot of us um, in the K-12 world have to rec uh, wrestle with is, are we just going to constantly be in the repair business, right? And there are social forces. You know, there's an explosion uh, in non-marital birth rates, particularly to young women, 24 and under. So there's just more and more kids that are being born into fragile families that have likely relationships with these sorts of outcomes. So we started thinking about this question a lot of, are we just a passive recipient of kids who are unprepared as a K through 12 system? Um, or can we extend our hand in some meaningful way? So back in 2014, we had the pleasure of partnering with Sesame Workshop uh, to launch uh, the Joan Gantz Cooney Early Learning Program as a universal pre-kindergarten pre 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 program as part of the New York City DOE. And that has been fantastic to get, to get our scholars at four years old. But even still, even at age four, we're seeing all sorts of deficits that we know um, if we had the opportunity to reach back even further, we could change those outcomes. Um, and not only to change the outcomes for kids, but were there ways that we could build the capacity of parents to become what we call an at-home reading coach? Um, and so thanks to Marjorie Mayer, uh, Sarah Walter, uh, we discovered the Parent-Child Home Program, which has these extraordinary results and to discover that there had never really been any kind of formal partnership between a K-12 system and, and a home visiting program really focused on these early learning outcomes. It just seems <laughs> absurd uh, that that would be the case. Um, so we are very excited to announce uh, that what we believe is the first of its kind partnership, uh, that Public Prep will be uh, partnering with Parent-Child Home Program so that, and Lee and Watts, uh, our, our delivery uh, partner, um, so that the younger siblings of our current boys prep and girls prep scholars will receive these two years of at-home visits twice a week over a two-year period, so uh, at least 92 visits, right? Um, so think about our scholars who are now 18 months old because because our current schools, especially in the Bronx, we see our families every single morning, and we actually see them with their baby carriages. Um, so we know that there's actually a large population of very young children, uh, and especially in the Bronx, our families don't leave. So we have a high degree of confidence that that 18-month-old that we're seeing now, two years from now, will be enrolling in our school. 
And because we have a charter system where you have sibling preference in the lottery, we know, we can say to that parent, we are with you. And so uh, we will uh, start this program starting in January with a pilot. Um, and it, it's almost obvious. It's almost crazy that this kind of relationship has not already existed. So while this may be an asterisk now, the hope is that over time, this becomes a normed activity where K-12, where we are spending $700 billion a year, we're figuring out ways to leverage some of those resources or create new resources um, to partner with entities, home visiting programs such as this one to just create far superior early learning outcomes for our kids. So with that, so very excited to announce that. Um, with that, let us bring up this amazing panel, starting with Shale uh, palakow saransky who is the president of Bank Street College of, Ed of Education. Um, you have bios of all of the panelists, so I'll just uh, go through these quickly. Uh, but Shale is incredible uh, on many fronts. Um, and as many of you know, under, uh, under Shale's leadership, Bank Street is building new models for teacher education, expanding its work with public schools and childcare centers, and developing an applied research center focused on early childhood policy and practice. Shale, sorry. Uh, we also have Barbara Reisman. Uh, Barbara is the senior advisor to the Mayher Charitable Foundation, a family foundation with a mission to reduce inequality by investing in policy, advocacy, and programs for young children and their families. Thank you, Barbara. I'd also like to invite Sarah Walter uh, to uh, the table. Sarah, who already identified, is the CEO of a Parent Child Home Program, and for, for more than 50 years, Parent Child Home. How many folks have? I've not heard? been the CEO. No, no. <laughs> How many folks have heard of Parent Child Home Program? Right. Okay. This 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 is a this room is in the know. Most people don't know that this organization or organizations of its type exist, and we have to change that. So, Sarah, thank you for joining us, and we're going to have Chris join the panel. Um, and so, let us get started. Uh, Shale, you've written that nationally we spend you know somewhere between 600 and 700 billion dollars a year on K to 12 education while only allocating about $20 billion to childcare and educational supports before children start school. So the obvious question seems to be, given the overwhelming evidence and the relationship between early, early uh, childhood outcomes and later success, why is there such an imbalance? Well, I think historically in the United States, there's been a political fight around childcare, which is centered on conservatives believing that if there's public funding for child care, that that's going to erode uh, families and that it's sort of a, a dichotomy has been set up um, that has caused um, a real deadlock in terms of building a high functioning system. And we're pretty unique in the world. When you look at other OECD countries, um, there's rough parity. Um, a, on a per capita basis between the spending at K-12 and the spending before children start school. Um, and it extends to a number of policies, including parental leave, um, sort of income for fam families that are struggling, but also um, real public investments in systems of childcare and systems of home visiting. And so I think the science has not penetrated the policy arena unfortunately, and I, like Chris, has, have spent my career mostly focused on K-12. Um, when I left the Department of Education, sort of similarly proud of real achievement gains that we had seen under Mayor Bloomberg, um, I was struck by the fact that even with all of the reforms that happened, uh, the achievement gap really hadn't moved. And when you dig into the data that Chris shared, it's now clear that we hadn't addressed where the achievement gap started. And so this is not something that you can fix quickly. You actually have to think creatively about what would the public infrastructure look like uh, to do this. 
part of it is a funding question. Uh, part of it is reorienting um, how we connect the dots. And so I think Chris's challenge of looking at this first at a city level is, is the kind of demonstration proof that would be helpful. Um, but I also think we all have an obligation to look at the different components of what the system is going to take and start to build those components. So at the point where the political will shifts, and we're seeing already in, in public polling data that there's more support um, nationally for funding um, for free childcare before children start school than there is um, for funding later in school and, and, uh, and post-secondary. But, and, and it's also interesting that some of the places that are doing some of the most innovative work are in red states, not necessarily at this point um, following the traditional sort of trajectory. So that there's a real chance, I think, that we see a wave of investments uh, in the coming decades. The question is, uh, are we going to be ready with models that can take those up and not reproduce the same dysfunctions that we have in the K-12 system? Yep. Um, Barbara uh, Shale identifies that there, there, there is a thankful shift or greater recognition for more investment in the early childhood arena. But what seems to be happening is people are seeing value in pre-K or 3K. Um, so the question that some critics say is, that's enough. Why, are, why, are, why is there, how do we make the case that the fight to even get uh, pre-K and, and you know, in, in New York, I think it's going to be called 3K for all, it's been such an enormous fight to get public support for those initiatives. How do we then go even further to say that there should be interventions publicly funded um, zero to three? Well, I think it's very important to understand that early childhood is a continuum that starts before children are born with the, making sure that their mothers get adequate prenatal care, which, as Chris pointed out, in Newark, third, more than a third of mothers get either late or no prenatal care. So that's a starting point. And, but early childhood goes from prenatal to children at age eight. And pre-K is a very important part of that. New Jersey has an exemplary pre-K program for children in our poor school districts. It's just being extended to other poor children in other school districts. And we have long-term data that shows that that preschool has made a lasting impact on children's performance in math and literacy measures. But it is also true, as Dale points out, that we have not done enough on the birth to three part of this, and that is the part where children's brain architecture is developed. And the architecture is both about children's cognitive skills and their social emotional development. So, that, you know, it's, I think it's very important that we recognize that this is a holistic process. And you can't, I actually had a funder one day, we have to, this funder who funds a lot in Newark spent two hours listening to people talk about early childhood development and the importance of early childhood. And then he said, well, why can't we just provide them with tutors when they are in kindergarten and we can just make up the literacy and math games and, and get them on the right path and it would be a lot cheaper to do that. But I think that reflects a fundamental misunderstanding of the science. The brain architecture does get developed in those early years. Poverty actually does affect the structure of a child's brain because of the adverse childhood experiences, which I think is a terrible, sanitized version of what, what adverse childhood experiences are trauma. Our kids experiencing violence, experiencing their parent being incarcerated, being evicted, watching a brother or a father be shot. I mean, you know, it's, it's, really terrible things that happen to kids and that affect them. It's not, not picking your child up after they cried for 20 minutes. Um, so we, I think we need to recognize the reality of parents' lives. And there are, Chris, plans for comprehensive approaches to early childhood interventions. Um, people have worked on them for years, and it's really important that we have new champions for this because I think the champions and the people talking about it make a real difference in whether people are actually paying attention. But we 
have examples here in the area of the Harlan Children's Zone that has taken a holistic approach to children from prenatal through K to 12, um, looking at parenting education, home visiting, early childhood education. We have the Presky and Kellogg Foundation, which just announced a $50 million initiative in Detroit that's going to start before birth and trying to address this. I think these kinds of place-based approaches are really valuable. And programs like Parent Child Home Project and other home visiting programs are one part of what needs to be done. But there also has to be the kind of policy framework and policy advocacy that powerful voices in this room can bring to this conversation. We need paid parental leave. We need more time off for parents. Parents, many parents don't even get time off when they're sick, paid time off. We need an increase in the minimum wage. Increasing parent uh, income actually makes a big difference in child outcome. So there are some very clear things that can be done in addition to the kinds of programmatic investments that the Parent Child Home Project and other uh, reading intervention and math intervention uh, Sarah, as someone who runs uh, a home visiting program outside of funding, what are some of the just the practical challenges uh, that you face in growing to scale? Are, are, are parents of very young children, are they receptive to the idea of someone coming into their home twice a week for two years? How, what, what are sort of the, just the pragmatic ways um, or pragmatic challenges that you face outside of, of funding? Um, so I I think one of the most important starting points is that um, I think in our experience, and I'm guessing the experience of everybody in this room, every parent wants most of all for their child to have a better life than they've had um, and to embark on that journey prepared for it. So um, our experience, and I know the experience of other both center and home visiting um, early childhood programs is that when services are made available to parents that are designed to help them get their child ready for school and life success, they engage. Um, over 85% of the families who start their home visiting journey with us finish the two years of, of the program um, and and want would love for their home visitor to keep coming. Um, and I, do, I think one of the important things to note is um, that maybe unlike the K through 12 um, education experience, not every family needs every one of the pieces in that prenatal to, to kindergarten continuum. Um, but every family needs some of the pieces. And, and part of that system has to be an array of services that are there to meet the needs of, of various families. Um, you know, and it ranges from really improving the quality of the child care that's available to families in their communities, both, both home-based child care and center-based care, to having home visiting services available to families who, who would welcome that service in their home, to having adequate health care and adequate pay and, and the other, all the other pieces that make up that continuum. But um, I, I, the challenge is not on the end of families not being interested and engaged um, in programming like this. Um, the, the, the challenge is really on the side of um, families not having access to programming like this and to other kinds of quality early childhood experiences for their children. Got it. I mean, just as an aside, we're, we are very excited for public prep to, to partner with Parent Child Home Program, not only because of what we see the benefits will be to the 18 month old, but we're also hoping to see benefits to the student who's already in our schools, because the parent now has a much greater appreciation around literacy, building this literacy rich environment at home. So we're hoping for multiplicative um, benefits. And then Chris, I, I can't help but ask you, you know, maybe the, the, the $64 million question, are our efforts in K to 12 futile until we develop a deliberate and coherent strategy around early learning? Thank you. So, um, absolutely not. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, there's this, this fight that goes on, uh, one of the sillier fights out there. That, you know, is poverty the cause of bad education, or is bad education the cause of 
poverty, and it's silly because we know that what goes on in the four brick walls of a school is highly relevant, and we can do a lot better. Uh, we could acknowledge the importance of great teachers and do more to get and train great teachers. For example, we can hold the children in the worst corners of uh, our urban environments to the same high standards around what it means to be competent in algebra one as you do in the le in the uh, in the affluent suburbs there's lots that you can do and we should do and we are doing often pushing a very heavy rock up a very steep hill and that's it's, it's important i think not to give up or be defeatist or say that that's irrelevant uh, because that makes a huge difference we are getting more and more kids, uh, you know, onto the lifeboat, if you will, uh, are more and more kids, you know, launched successfully into life. But at the same time, um, there's no denying that, you know, what happens outside the home and what happens in the early years is, uh, you know, not only relevant, but probably the most predictive variable in a child's learning trajectory. So we really do need to do both. And while I've stolen the microphone, I'm going to do Two quick things. One, I want to say, because I forgot to say it in my speech, that uh, Ron, raise your hand, Ron. Well, there he is. Uh, Ron is the head of the Newark Trust for Education, and we are partnering and are on the brink of entering into a contract with PCHP. So we are uh, very much focused. We're not quite ready to make the grand announcement uh, because we got to get a little some tied, tied up, but we're 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 going to get it. We're going to get that done. Uh, and then secondly, I want to say, uh, okay, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, um, uh, and then the, I, I just want to quickly introduce uh, an idea for some of you entrepreneurs out there. Uh, it is absolutely true, as Barbara correctly points out and correctly corrects me, that there's a lot going on in this field, Harlem Children's Zone and, there, and many other places. What is really, I think, lacking um, is a coherent, comprehensive case management system and data management system that actually executes against another point Barbara made, which is not every program or intervention is right for every child. But just to give, just to give you an example, if I knew today, right, every single child who's going to be a kindergarten in Newark who is currently in foster care, right, who is somewhere between birth and four, if I literally was able to identify them, right, and say for those kids, we need a particularly intentional, specialized set of, set of interventions, I can hypothesize, I can't guarantee that that would make a huge difference. But we have almost no coherent data system that integrates housing information, uh, 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 transients, uh, uh, access to resources, who's going to pre-K, what pre-K program, and a thousand different variables. And you start, you're starting to see these, right, in the Northern Achievement Zone, in uh, Tulsa, and in a number of different places. But I would venture to say that the right place to really do this on a comprehensive basis is a moderate-sized city like New Haven or Newark, I would say, or others, where you can get a single comprehensive data management system that is a queryable database that allows you to track not high concepts but Johnny and Marie and track them through and give them targeted interventions all the way through their through their journey. And I'm really looking forward to, and I actually think there are prototypes out there that are potentially very, very, very promising. You see, when you're in the public sector, you never answer the question. Yeah, exactly. yeah you can. <laughs> All right, with that, oh yeah, go ahead. I, I would say, I, I'd take a little stronger view on this than, I, I, I agree that you need to keep working at the K-12 system, <laughs> but if you're serious about equity, there's no way we're, we're going to fix that without dealing with zero to three. And so, yeah, it is futile in that sense um, to keep pushing without really seriously investing at zero to three. And I think it's worth starting to think about, given that we're unlikely to unlock huge new public funding streams, we have a lot of money in K-12. How do we start to push some of that down? And what can we stop doing um, and stop wasting money on in K-12 and push down to zero to three? And, you know, the, the truth of the challenge at zero to three, there's really good data and, and research now on home visiting. There's much less that's been done uh, on figuring out how do we build the childcare system that we want. And what we know is that the folks who are working in childcare generally get paid less than dog walkers, um, that the workforce themselves is often in poverty, 
many of them have their own childhood and adult trauma that they're carrying with them. Um, and those needs are not necessarily being addressed. And there aren't instructional supports in the sense of uh, helping caregivers, either in home-based or center-based care, to actually understand brain development, understand some of these concepts around what, what kinds of materials, what kinds of interactions, what kinds of relationships can you form at different stages of an infant, a toddler, a child's development. And until we start to invest in that workforce and take a serious approach to developing them, I don't think we're actually going to solve this problem. And you know, one thing that we're doing at Bank Street to respond to that is we've developed a model that we're piloting in the East New York right now mm -hmm. that basically takes our master's program and distills it into a five-month intensive coaching experience for home-based um, child care providers. Mm -hmm. And so it has some of the same sort of principles that drive home visiting programs for parents, um, but it's actually thinking about the caregivers who are not parents. And three quarters of our children are with caregivers who are not their parents for 10 or 12 hours a day. Um, and many of those settings, I'd say about 80 or 90 percent, um, at best, what we're seeing is, is neglect, you know, with babies sitting in cribs with a TV in the background. Um, sometimes it's worse. There are great people also working in this space, but uh, they don't tend to stay long. And so how do we start to both create a set of instructional experiences for caregivers build that workforce so that it, there is a real sort of reason to stay in the role, that there's enough compensation, um, that there's enough stability, um, that we can start to see this other element of the system actually begin to take root and grow. I just want to add to Shail's eloquent remarks that one of the distinction, people often make the distinction between children's preschool needs at three and four, which is, has a lot more public support than interventions from birth to three. But these workforce issues go across the, this continuum. One of the things we see in Newark, for example, is when we train teachers in the, who are in birth to three, they leave to go to three and four-year-old programs because in New Jersey, teachers in preschool have to be paid the same as teachers in the public school system. And that means a huge difference in their compensation and the respect that they're accorded because they're seen as teachers. There are still people, um, in the, in, even in the state of New Jersey, who think that early childhood education is just glorified babysitting. That is a direct quote from our the outgoing governor. Um, so, um, you know, we, we have a lot to do to change people's mindsets about what is actually happening for children birth to three in those settings. We also, I think, still have a certain amount of hostility to women in the workforce. And we still, there are people who still think that mothers should be home with their children, even though from if we have two thirds of mothers with children under the age of one who are in the labor force. And so we need to adjust our thinking and our programs and our policies to recognize the reality of people's lives. And I'm hoping that with our new champions here, we can begin to do that. Okay. Yeah, question. I was just going to add one last piece, which I think we don't want to neglect in this room, and, and it's parents. Um, and one of the things that a full array of the programming zero to four does is prepare parents to be the really powerful advocates for what happens in the K to 12 system, not only for their own children, but in their communities um, and for what happens in the childcare setting. And the Parent Child Home Program is now doing some work with home-based providers that we got into because we started to hear from our parents that the home-based providers they were going to were not reflecting what those parents had learned in the Parent Child Home Program. And they were starting to advocate for better child care. We have parents who've taken <coughs> over the Head Start committee, parental committees in the Head Start centers they've gone to because they came into that Head Start center knowing what 
quality early childhood experiences should be for their children um, and started to push for that. So part of what reaching out to parents, whether it's through home visiting or through center-based settings that also do parent education, part of what we're doing is really building that political constituency that's gonna help improve the quality of childcare, but also continue that trajectory into the K through 12 setting. And we know that children who have parents who are engaged and feel comfortable being engaged in their education as they move from school, those children do better as they move from school. And those are the kind of parents that, that you want in, in all of your educational settings. Okay, we have about 10 minutes worth of time, but uh, questions for our free panel. No way that there's, there we go. Okay. So you have eight as a background for your um, resume, I suppose. What do you think, Gates announced recently their new $1.7 billion well investment, right, yeah. in, in K through 12. Yeah. Why, knowing how smart so many of the folks are at Gates, would they not sort of recognize this as, sorry to ask you that No, question. no, no. It's you asked the right person. It's, it's, it's a very relevant I'm question. I'm curious. I actually just finished an essay uh, called uh, Speaking Truth to Power, uh, Bill Gates' Mystifying Omission of, uh, and in this case, uh, Fragile Families. So he, he, read your essay. Yeah, right. So no, everyone should read this. So Bill Gates, about three weeks ago, wrote a 3,000-word essay reflecting on uh, what he and his wife Melinda have learned over the last 17 years investing billions and billions of dollars in domestic education. Um, and one of his big points is that he's frustrated that the same disparities that animated their interest 17 years ago still exist today. Uh, and that he makes a commitment to invest another close to $2 billion over the next five years. And some of it's for charter schools that invest in special needs, it's networks. In the 3,000 words, he doesn't mention the word family, nor does he mention the word parent. It's extraordinary. And he had to be called out on it. So I, call, I wrote an essay on that front. Um, but it, it's, it's really hard. You know, I was, again, I was at the, uh, the foundation in Washington State. The foundation does a bit more investment in uh, early childhood, but generally it's just not, it's, it's not, um, it's just not part of their playbook. Um, if there are others that want to con, and by the way, that's really important because how Gates goes influences a lot of other uh, funders, and it's extraordinary to me that they are not weighing in heavily. I mean, look at this chart. I mean, there, there's this very sobering inevitability about this chart, right? When kids don't get that level of language exposure at the very beginning, the level of predictability is so high. There's a reason we spend six to seven hundred billion dollars a year every year and we're not getting the outcomes we want. I think it, it's actually the reason that's happened is emblematic of the same reason that Chris and I are only starting to talk about this issue in the last couple of years is that Gates is organized where the K-12 section is separate from the folks who work on early childhood. Um, so it, there's a demarcation line similar to what we see in most of our school systems. Um, and in most of our state government and the federal level. And so as long as you have a structural barrier that says, you folks over here focus on this, you're gonna get this problem. And so part of the challenge is rethinking some of the structure. And I think that um, that, that does speak to another question, which we haven't talked about yet, which is what happens when you do really well in early childhood and then a child enters kindergarten and suddenly um, they're supposed to sit down, be quiet and do worksheets. Um, and the sort of thoughtful um, integration of cognitive skills and socio-emotional skills that strong early childhood programs deliver goes out the window completely when they turn from four to five. And then we get surprised that suddenly some of those gains that we were starting to see in early childhood start to decline. Right, and then the full cycle occurs where we shouldn't then invest in early childhood because the outcomes dissipate over time. So this, this, this virtuous, terrible cycle. But I also have a question for you, which is similar, which is that, you know, in New York City, among the charter sector, we have a high-performing charter sector, but so few have taken up on pre-K. 
And I'm curious as a leader in that community. Yes. I don't understand. <laughs> we we so first of all, when Bill de Blasio, I know, launched, there's, I know there are facility issues, but it seems no, it's not a facilities issue. Um, I mean, there's there's always facilities issue, but that's not the primary issue. When um, when Bill de Blasio first launched universal pre-K and kindergarten charter, and actually charters were essentially banned from even having the opportunity, yeah. and so we had to fight right. really hard even to get the right to do it. So we launched ours in 2014. We'll be launching a second one um, at our boys' school in 2018. And for us, it's just fundamental. I mean, so fundamental that if we could, we'd also participate in 3K for all. Right. But charters are not yet allowed to participate, right. so fine. But we'll fight. We'll, we'll eventually get there. Um, but for us, it's so important that we're now partnering with Parent Child Home Program because the earlier, the better. I, it, is, it, it is unfathomable to me why Bill Gates wouldn't talk about this in his essay. It's unfathomable to me why other charter leaders wouldn't jump at the chance get their kids starting at four years old. It just, it, it boggles my mind. I don't know why. Hopefully by us doing the kinds of things that we're doing, all of us will recognize that we have to break this wall that exists between K through 12 and early childhood. I just want to make a quick comment because I think in, just for disclosure, I know Barbara well, we worked together in New Jersey on different early um, childhood uh, learning programs. Right there, you said something that I think is, I, I like the way Barbara phrased the early childhood, prenatal to eight, because by doing so, you're breaking that mythical artificial barrier between zero to five and K to 12. I think that's really important, and that's a way to get started to help others understand that it's a continuum. Um, and then I do have a question, so that's, that's one point. On the Parent Child Home Program, I'm curious if through your efforts, if you've seen a distinction, because I'm assuming any low-income families could qualify for this, even if they may be in part or full-time in an early childhood program already, versus those that receive, you know, at home all the time or, or a neighbor's home or something like that. Have you noticed the difference between those two groups? Uh, so that's a great question. Um, I would say no, and I would say primarily for exactly the reasons that Shale outlined, which is most of our families who are in also in child care are in pretty low quality child care. So it's not like they're getting that in those years that sort of double enrichment piece. What we do see a real advantage of is children who've had the two cycles of the parent child home program and then have participated in a quality pre-K program. So kids who have had two years of parent-child, then a quality four-year-old pre-K program, when they get to kindergarten, they look um, significantly more prepared and more effective in the classroom than children who have had nothing, but also than children who just had the four-year-old pre-K. And I think that's because they were much better able to take advantage of the quality 4K experience because they came into that classroom prepared to be there. So Ron Tyler Thomas of New York Trust. Um, I guess I, I hear that this, right, the, the economy here is K-12 and, and sort of pre-formal education, let's say. Uh, but there are, other, there are other kind of groups to think about, right? So, so I'm interested kind of in the notion of, you know, how does healthcare fit into this in the sense of it's the primary place where parents are bringing their young people um, and get a lot of information. Um, and so kind of thinking about that. And then having grown up in a family of six, I also think quite a bit about uh, a comprehensive, this comprehensive approach um, and, not, and, and breaking down barriers that sometimes we don't even think about. And so, you know, I grew up in a family where my older brothers and sisters were responsible for our younger brothers and sisters' educational approach. Um, and sometimes we really think about moms or dads, uh, but we don't necessarily think about the family unit. You talk about how Bill and Melinda don't even think that. Um, and I was just recently at a, a community engagement forum where at a table of nine, there were two great-grandparents, two grandparents, a parent, and two kids. Um, and so there's something to me about broadening this conversation, and I understand kind of you got to get refined in order to get something going. <laughs> Uh, but then I feel impact is about taking that refinement and broadening the discussion. And so 
as, as you know, you're thinking about the parent child home network piece, I know that it's anyone who's giving primary care to the young person. Um, you know, and I know we talked a little bit about thinking, is there another phase of this work which is about bringing either the families who are receiving this care together in networks, or is it about bringing families together? So I'm just wondering how you're thinking about those pieces as, as you've done this work. So I think that's one of the really powerful things about getting into the home, um, not just parent-child home program, but, but uh, any home visiting model, because then you do get to connect with all of those adults who may have a significant influence on, on the life of a child or children, and you get to engage the other siblings, um, you know, in the way that Ian is expecting and, and our day-to-day our -day shows, you'll see the impact on the older siblings because you've gotten the adults in the home engaged and feeling uh, powerful and competent in the educational sector. But we definitely work with um, grandparents, great-grandparents, moms, dads, aunts, uncles, and sometimes older siblings who are the other folks in the home um, who are helping to support that child's education. So um, I think it's a value of getting into the home, but I think you're also absolutely right that there's also a real value of um, getting people out and, and engaged in networks and connecting them. And one of the things we find to feel connected to people in the community and then to be willing to come out to whether it's a parenting workshop, whether it's a group session on pre-K and their pre-K options in the community and how to register for it. Um, or it's a field trip to give both the parents and the adults uh, an exper a life experience that, that they may not have had before they entered school when they're entering classrooms with lots of kids who've had lots of those experiences. You know, the, our program was actually founded on Long Island and the number of families there we work with have never been to the beach, but it's often only 20 minutes from where they live um, and who you can take to have that experience before they walk into a classroom with lots of kids who spent their entire summers at the beach. I think is a really important piece. I know we've talked a lot in Newark about the fact that the Newark Children's Museum is free for all families. In Newark, about hundreds of thousands of families never get there because it's outside of their social sphere and the ability to get families, all generations of them, out and into those other settings to engage with I, I just want to underscore some of the elements of what Sarah has just said that I think would be true for Parent home, Child Home Project and other successful projects, which is that you need intensive uh, connections between parents and their children, between the, the people who are doing the intervention and the adults, that the children need consistent relationships, supportive relationships with caring adults, whether it's their parents, their grandparents, or other people, and that there's a level of respect for and acknowledgement of the values in the community. The fact that the Parent Child Home Project uses elements of its success because we're talking about people who are connected within the community, can break down that social isolation, speak the language of the parents if they're not English, native English speakers. Uh, that, those are all really important elements and working with trusted people. One of the other successful reading intervention programs is Reach Out and Read where you have uh, pediatricians who are prescribing uh, reading as, and giving a book to children who are making their pediatric visits. There are lots of these kinds of interventions. They need to be scaled. They need to be more broadly known about, and they need the kind of philanthropic and public investment that we're all talking about here. One final question. Yeah, you had raised your hand earlier, I think. Um, thank you. Uh, wow, this has been so enlightening and uh, exciting, um, hopeful. I'm curious about the foot soldiers uh, in this effort. The, I don't even know what you call them. The people who go into the homes, the teachers, counselors. I mean, on one hand, it seems like, gosh, they have to be so talented to handle all those complicated issues when you go into someone's home and you're dealing with their kids and 
whatever their situation is. And on the other hand, they get paid less than dog catchers. And so um, what is it that's required, or dog catchers, dog walkers, right? <laughs> what is it that's required for uh, someone who's going into this work um, to be able to have the kind of effects that you see? It seems like um, they may not be the most um, I don't know, educated or prepared people in your workforce, but still the uh, success is apparent. So could you speak to that, Sarah? Sure. Um, and, and first of all, I, I just want to give a quick shout out to all of the um, home visiting models who use an array of different folks, depending on what their goals are. So the nurse family partnership, which we partner with often that works prenatally to age two in community, those home visitors are nurses. And that's because they really are de delivering critical health guidance to the, to the families they're working with. Um, other models that, that, that do the work with the age group we're working with and, and that are really focused on empowering the parents to be the critical person in that home, in that educator role, um, use what, what used to be called in the field paraprofessionals. So for, for the parent-child home program, our home visiting staff um, are not required to have a college degree. Um, they go through an intensive training program and very intensive ongoing supervision with us. But the, really the key um, things that we're looking for are their ability to model for other parents in their community. And what we have found is that folks who live in the community, who have children who are in school and experiencing some success, are the best um, mentors really for, for the parents um, that they're going to be doing this modeling for. So 25% of our home visiting staff are actually parents who went through our program as parents and then get hired and trained to, to, to visit with, with other families. And our data actually shows us that they are probably our most effect, effective mentors and networkers for the community. Um, I, I, I will say that uh, they, they are not paid anywhere near the value that they are giving uh, society, and, and that's an ongoing challenge for, I think, those of us who run programs and those of us in the private and philanthropic sectors who are trying to figure out how to scale them, um, because uh, it's not something that as a society, uh, this work or center-based child care work or home-based child care work that we value at anywhere near um, the value that we will get out of having it done well and out of the field. Okay. Um, uh, well, Josh is going to close. I was going to just one minute closing comments for each uh, panelist. Shale, anything final you'd like to say? I, I think that one of the most powerful things that we can be doing at this point is figuring out how to look hard at what makes these models scalable or not. Um, we're not necessarily going to be able to do the perfect thing. And so we need to figure out what is enough um, to move the needle and how do we put that in place at a level where you don't have to have superstars at every level of the organization, whether it's the home visitor or the daycare provider um, in order to make this work. And the truth is that it is actually possible to create re real high quality um, without spending huge amounts of money on it. Um, part of the problem that we're, we're dealing with is that um, we're still in a triage mode. Um, we, we haven't had the opportunity in many instances to set it up right from the start. And so building systems that actually support this work so that it isn't up to individual nonprofit organizations to carry the load um, is the next step. And that's, that's where a lot of the thinking needs to be done. I want to underscore those comments about the importance of the systematic approach, a systemic approach, and also to say that I think one of the things that we've learned in this field is that there are lots of successful programs. There are no single magic bullets. We need to take real holistic approach to the lives of children and their families. Children live in families. You can't just save the kids. You've got to think about what's happening with their parents and their caregivers. If you want the kids to do well, their parents also have to do well.
I'm just going to echo all of that and raise the point that I think it's, in fact, the reason why big philanthropy like the Gateses have not gotten engaged in this sector because it's complicated and messy and it isn't yet a system that you can just say, okay, I'm going to invest $2 billion in this system. Instead, you need to think about families and the fact that there are different things that are going to be necessary for each of the folks on that zero to four spectrum in order for them to succeed. Um, but I'm feeling much better about the fact that we're going to be able to build a system for the folks in the room today. So, I mean, the, 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 the sort of reformer's dilemma in this is do you define success as getting as many kids, to use an overused metaphor, onto the lifeboat as possible and feel good about that, which means that episodic pebbles in the pond, um, you know, are valuable and worth doing because we learn from it and we help, you know, kids with real names and real lives and so on. Or do you, or do you say that actually um, – that's exactly what we need not to do. What we need to do is solve the structural and organizational and unlock the funds that enable a comprehensive systemic uh, approach first. And uh, I actually have never comfortably come up to an answer to that question, but I will say that until there is, I guess I'm going back to where my colleagues went, a systems-wide reorientation of funds and, and infrastructure um, that can take these interventions which are shown to be working and target them using an effective overall data management system with appropriate messaging and so on to, to, the, to the community. Until we sort of get that right as a sort of proof of context is this is how a city solves the achievement gap through early childhood intervention. Then I worry that, and I think the Gates, meant, the Gates example is a very, very powerful one. We're always going to be doing 100 kids here, 100 kids there, these eight square blocks here, and, and which are great. I mean, we should invest in those things. But that is not going to solve the sort of moral um, dilemma that we started with today. And, uh, and as a leader in the charter sector and, you know, now running public prep for the last eight years, it, it has been the sort of ethos of at least the ed reform movement that there is this sort of uh, no excuses environment, right? We can overcome any hurdle. We can overcome poverty. We can, we, we can just do it all. It doesn't matter what the incoming readiness levels are for kids because it's just been excuses. That's why things haven't worked and we can make it happen. And I just think the data that you show just just under just undermines that. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be relentless in terms of trying to create fantastic results in the K through 12 system but we are being delusional if we're not mm -hmm. having a deliberate and focused effort um, prenatal um, uh, through eight as well. Um, Josh Schwartz is going to close uh, our session. Hi, so I'm, I'm uh, Josh Schwartz, and I'm on the board of PCHP. Um, first of all, can we have a round of applause? Terrific discussion and exactly what we were hoping for. Um, I also want to thank PCG and uh, the host committee, um, some of whom are here, some of whom are not here, who did a fantastic job at organizing this. As uh, we've previously described, this is the first convening of the School Readiness Forum. I just want to explain um, what the objective of the School Readiness Forum is. Our objective is to raise awareness uh, for this area of um, early learning and home visits and everything that happens outside the K-12 school system that, uh, that we've described uh, this morning. And um, if we're successful, I think uh, someone from the Gates Foundation can join the host committee. <laughs> you can get Bill to uh, participate in one of these. Um, but seriously, it should be obvious to, to everyone here that um, this area of home visits, community engagement, um, early learning, this really should be the tip of the spear uh, for what we're trying to accomplish here. So in the, in the coming days, we're going to be emailing out to all of you here, hopefully it's welcome, a list of resources, books, research, articles, and the like to help those of you who are interested in diving a little bit deeper uh, get more information on this, uh, on this subject. And if you're feeling inspired or motivated, we welcome more involvement 
really want to raise awareness here and create a movement and in part catalyze the, the types of relationships that you heard about with PCHP and public prep and uh, soon to be announced Newark. And so um, with that, I will close and just say thank you for coming and have a great day. Say it again. Feel free to use essay and what you send around. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the slide. And the slide. And the slide. <laughs> and if you want more information, please see me, please see Sarah, Courtney, Amen in the back. Um, we're not hard to find.
it is. Right. So he's right. So he doesn't that would be something that just does not 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 that would be something that just does not